So our next speaker is, is a shift in gears, but also um, using vast amounts of data. Um, Karen Wilcox from the University of Texas at Austin will talk about predictive data science for physical systems, um, for model reduction to scientific machine learning. Karen Wilcox is the director of the Odin Institute for Computational Engineering and Sciences and a professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. She holds the W.A. Tex Moncrief Junior Chair in Simulation-Based Engineering and um, Sciences and the Peter O'Donnell Junior Centennial Chair in Computing Systems. Before joining the Odin Institute in 2018, she spent 17 years as a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where she served as the founding co-director of the MIT Center for Computational Engineering and the associate head of the MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Prior to joining the MIT faculty, she worked at Boeing Phantom Works with the Blended Wing Body Aircraft Design Group. Her research has produced scalable computational methods for the design of next generation engineered systems with a particular focus on model reduction as a way to learn principled approximations from data and on multi-fidelity formulations to leverage multiple sources of uncertain information. She's a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Please welcome Karen Wilcox. Okay, well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's really great to uh, be here today and to share with you some thoughts on the notion of predictive data science. And I have to say it's a pretty tough act uh, to follow those beautiful visuals, visuals zooming around the universe. So uh, very clearly I will be bringing you all back down to earth with a little bit simpler graphics. Uh, so before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, folks, the team who have contributed to the work that you're going to see today. So uh, Michael Kaptein is one of my current PhD students, still physically at MIT, and it's uh, mostly his work that you'll see in the, the second part of the talk. Uh, Stephanie Salinger is one of my, my graduate students at UT Austin. Uh, she's also working with the, the physical vehicle that you'll see. Uh, Dr. David Knezovic, the CTO of Excellus, a small startup company that uh, we're working with to build digital twins. Luen Huang, a computer scientist who uh, works in predictive data science and in design, uh, again with me at MIT. And then Corey Kays, a former master's student who was the lead of the team at Aurora Flight Sciences that uh, helped us to build the, build the vehicle. So I want to do uh, really two main things today. I want to start off with some rather high-level uh, thoughts about data science, about computational science, and uh, really thinking about where we've come from and, and where we're headed. Then in the second part of the talk, I will dive a little more into details. I'm going to give you an example that comes from my own research area where we're building a predictive, data, a, a predictive digital twin. And you'll see that this predictive digital twin is an example of predictive data science bringing physics and data together, and then close with uh, some conclusions and outlook. So here's the question that is on literally everybody's minds. I'm sure it's on the minds of, of uh, many, if not all of you, which is how do we harness the explosion of data to extract knowledge, insight, and decisions? And today I want to consider this question in the context of uh, challenging complex applications in science, engineering, and medicine. And so, of course, this question is not new. This question has been at the heart of the scientific process for, in fact, many, many centuries. But when we ponder this question today, it takes on a different uh, context, a different uh, nature. And it takes on a different nature because, first of all, we have so much more data today, and we've just seen a great example of that. Uh, we are, have the ability to measure and observe physical and natural systems around us like never before. It also takes on a different nature because we're equipped with incredibly powerful computational methods and computers that, again, let us answer this question in, in different ways. And third, it takes on a different nature because there has been so much success in harnessing the data in a range of applications that have impacted everything about our lives, from uh, recommendation systems that help us shop or help us choose entertainment, uh, to image recognition, speech recognition, and, and much more. 
And so, as I said, I want to think about this question in the context of systems in, in across engineering, science, and medicine. And right now, we're seeing a tremendous amount of excitement in taking methods that have been so incredibly impactful in the computer science domain, uh, and particularly machine learning, bringing those methods and applying them to complex problems in science and engineering and medicine. And that's uh, both very exciting, but also, I will say, as an aerospace engineer, that's quite terrifying. And uh, the reason I say it's terrifying is because the problems that I see as an aerospace engineer, pro problems that we see in, in medicine and science and, and more broadly in engineering, are of a very different nature to the problems where machine learning has been so successful. And one very big difference is the, uh, the consequence of the decisions that we make. So very clearly the, the consequences, the decision of whether or not to remove somebody's prostate is of very, very different consequence to the decision about recommending a movie to somebody, or the decision on how to size an aircraft wing that's going to fly hundreds of people thousands of miles across an ocean, clearly a very different consequence to a decision that might relate to somebody's social media network. So in engineering, in science, and in medicine, we make high consequence decisions, big de decisions, and what I want to try to uh, convey to you today is that these big big decisions need more than just big data. The big data are incredibly powerful and valuable, but these kinds of big decisions need big models too. And as just one example uh, there in the, the lower right, the billion dollar decisions that are being made today about building infrastructure for coastal protection on the coast of, of Texas, very clearly that will be based on data that we've collected from, from past hurricanes. But of course, these decisions cannot be based on the data alone. They have to be based on predictions of the future. And those predictions can really only be made if we start to bring models, physics-based models, that allow us to play what-if scenarios and, uh, and again, drive these, these very big decisions. So big decisions need more than just big data. Perhaps there are some uh, folks who might say, well, no, it's actually really just a matter of getting more data. Well, clearly, if we're talking hurricanes, getting more data is not a good thing for the planet. But even in applications uh, like in medicine, in the uh, diagnosis and the treatment of cancer, again, I'd make the case that it's not just a matter of getting a bigger and bigger database of, of patients. And let me give you four reasons why I believe that's the case. The first is that these kinds of high-consequence applications tend to be characterized by complex, multi-scale, multi-physics phenomena. So why is that important? What does that mean? That means that these are systems for which, if we change the parameters of the system just a little bit, change the initial conditions, change the geometry, change the material properties, we can see drastically different behavior in the, in the resulting system. The systems are highly sensitive. And this is especially true when a system is in the conditions that are most critical for driving a decision, when a system is close to failure or close to some kind of instability boundary. And so an approach that's based purely on interpolating data, no matter how much data you have and no matter how expressive your interpolation, or even worse, an approach that's based on extrapolating data is, uh, in these situations, I believe, doomed, doomed to failure. Second is the high dimensionality of the parameter space. Again, these kinds of problems are characterized uh, in many cases by continuous parameter fields, material properties, geometry, that are in fact infinite dimensional. And when we discretize those parameters uh, for computational models, we don't get hundreds or thousands, but rather millions or even billions of degrees of freedom. Now, of course, the, the system's behavior is so often characterized by a much lower dimensional structure, but again, an approach that simply uses data and sees these million or billion dimensional parameter spaces is going to, uh, be, going to be in real trouble. Third is we talk about big data, and indeed, it's often the case that we may have a lot of data to deal with, but in fact, uh, for many, many problems in engineering, in science, and in medicine, the data are actually really quite sparse. They're particularly sparse relative to the high dimensionality of the, the parameter space that we need to characterize. And they're also often, again, most sparse in the regions that are most critical towards uh, dr driving a, a decision. Those are the places where it's hardest to get data, whether experimentally or from simulations. And what's more, it's not just a matter of collecting more and more and more data, because the data are intrusive to collect. 
physical sensors everywhere in our envi environment or intrusive tests on a human patient and are often expensive to acquire. And then finally is the uh, critical role of uncertainty quantification. Of course, the data are imperfect, the models are also imperfect. Nonetheless, we need to make decisions with imperfect information. And so, of course, it's critical to quantify the uncertainties associated with the predictions that drive those decisions and to incorporate that, incorporate our risk preferences uh, as, we, as we start to make decisions. So big decisions need more than just big data. They need big models too. And what do I mean by big models? By big models, I mean mathematical models of the governing laws of nature combined with high-performance computing to create sophisticated computational simulations that let us model these systems and, uh, and try to predict the future. And this is really what sits at the heart of the field of computational science, not to be confused by, with uh, computer science, which unfortunately sounds very similar, but computational science, or sometimes referred to as computational science and engineering, CS&E, which is an interdisciplinary field that uses mathematical modeling and advanced computing to understand and solve complex problems. And really what's key about computational science is that at its very core is the notion of using mathematical models, uh, again manifested as computational uh, simulations, to reason and understand the about the physical and the natural world around us. So when I, when I say big decisions need big models and when we read that in uh, machine learning and AI, we need to start making our, uh, our inferences be able to have predictive power, to be interpretable, and to embed domain knowledge, then again, I wanna make the case to you that when we say those things, what we really are talking about is computational science, bringing in the notion of physics-based models uh, and combining that with our, our data to drive these predictive simulations. So physics-based models, what is a physics-based model? A physics-based model is a representation of the governing laws of nature that innately embeds the concept of time, space, and causality. And what's so uh, incredible, what's so elegant about physics-based models is that they literally take the vast parameter space, the infinite dimensional parameter space, and they define the physics-based models, the governing laws define these low-dimensional manifolds on which the solution must reside. Uh, again, uh, a solution manifold defined by the laws of nature. So not always, but in many cases, these kinds of physics-based models are represented by sy systems of differential equations and often systems of partial differential equations. And I'm showing you uh, one example here, the equations of linear elasticity. So these are the equations. This is a mathematical model of how solid objects deform. So given different loading conditions, forces, and things you could apply to a solid model, what is the corresponding stress and strain uh, and displacement of, of, that, of that solid? And clearly this is a critically important question in many, many, many applications, again, across engineering, across science, and across medicine. You can see here on the slide some of the elements of the physics-based model. So there on the left, the equation of motion, that's the familiar Newton's second law, mass times acceleration is equal to the, the sum of the applied forces. You can see the uh, equation in the middle there that represents the relationship between strain and displacement, and then the constitutive equations representing the relationship between the strain, epsilon, and the stress sigma uh, related by a stiffness tensor there, uh, C, which will depend on the material that we're, we're modeling. So again, just an example, but the idea is that uh, a physics-based model is often represented by systems of equations, and then what we do is to take those systems of equations to apply discretization methods uh, to create massive computational models that we can then solve with high-performance computing. And again, what's so incredible, what's so unreasonably effective about mathematical models, about physical, physics-based models, is that they literally are a predictive window into the future. Given, in this example, initial conditions, boundary conditions, geometry, material properties, and the loading conditions, we can run what-if scenarios and, in this case, predict stress, strain, displacement, whatever we like about an aircraft wing and how it will, uh, how it will reside, un uh, how it will uh, respond un under different conditions. So this notion of mathematical models 
combined with high-performance computing and manifested as large computational models, again, is what sits at the heart of computational science and engineering. And uh, this is not new. So for six decades, computational science and engineering has been advancing scientific discovery and driving engineering innovation. Now, of course, the mathematical roots of the field go back even further, but we could look into uh, the 1950s, 60 years ago, to see some of the first simulations that were done of these, uh, of these kinds of physics-based mathematical models. So approaches like the finite element method, which has its roots in uh, the structural analysis for engineering systems, but over the past six decades has grown to impact so many different fields, from structures to aerodynamics, to reservoir modeling, to modeling earthquakes, uh, to modeling the human heart, biological systems, climate dynamics, and many, many more. And even today, it's a very active area of research to create the next generation of Ford simulations that again advance scientific discovery and engineering innovation, uh, modeling very complex multi-scale and multi-physics systems. If we fast forward a little bit into the 80s and 90s, uh, there was a, a big appreciation for the power of combining these complex forward simulations together with optimization algorithms. And this is not just a matter of taking an off-the-shelf opt optimization algorithm, but rather really intricately embedding the optimization with the forward simulation, uh, exploiting the structure of the problem, and using methods such as uh, the adjoint method to create scalable optimization algorithms that could solve massive problems, problems governed by partial differential equations, uh, really important problems that show up in things like parameter estimation, engineering design, optimal control, and more. Then, uh, and, and of course, if we look in the world around us, we see the tremendous benefits of uh, optimization of these kinds of systems at work. So as just one example, if uh, on your flight home you're lucky enough to fly on uh, a Boeing 787, which is a beautiful aircraft. Have a look out the window and you'll see the wings and notice just how incredibly thin, how slender and elegant those wings are. And when you see that, you'll know that it's computational science and engineering that achieve that through, again, scalable optimization combined with large-scale simulations of the physics governing the flow over the wing uh, and the, the behavior of the structure to be able to optimize uh, that shape and to get tremendous gains in performance and, and fuel efficiency. Moving forward a little bit more in time uh, into the 21st century and maybe in the last 15 years or so, there's been a huge focus in the computational science and engineering community on the field of uncertainty quantification. So this is a realization that it's absolutely essential to quantify uncertainty associated with uh, any kind of computational simulation. And of course, a big part of that is to recognize that these laws of nature, these physics-based models are themselves often imperfect. And so this has really been a drive towards what's called predictive science. So the Department of Energy defines predictive science as the use of verified and validated computational systems to predict uh, behavior and properties of complex phenomena. So again, you see this emphasis on being able to predict. And then we come to today with all the excitement around uh, data science and machine learning and the growing field of scientific machine learning, which you heard about on uh, Tuesday from, from Nathan Baker. So scientific machine learning seeking to embrace both the challenges and the opportunities of bringing machine learning to uh, complex problems in, in science and engineering. And again, just like with uncertainty quantification and optimization, it is not just a matter of taking off-the-shelf optimization, off-the-shelf statistic, statistical methods, or off-the-shelf machine learning methods to apply to these very complex problems, but really uh, it's, it's a need, there's, there's a strong need to again intricately look at the structure of the problem, to think about the nature of the Ford simulations, and to really uh, design a, a new class of, of scalable methods. And again, just like uncertainty quantification tries to get us towards predictive science, in uh, scientific machine learning, it's not enough just to have data science. We need to issue predictions in support of these big decisions. We really need to be thinking about predictive data science. So all these many elements uh, really, again, coming back to the question I posed in the beginning, how do we harness the explosion of data to extract knowledge, insight, and decisions? And I would make the case that when it comes to complex problems, 
in science, engineering, and medicine, big decisions, this is what it means to harness the data. Not machine learning alone, but rather all of these things, forward simulations, optimization, inverse problems, uncertainty quantification, and scientific machine learning all, all working together. So if we were to dive down a little bit into uh, now this, this notion of predictive data science and scientific machine learning, we would see many different uh, methods and approaches within computational science and engineering that have a very important play to role, a, a very important role to play. In the next part of the talk, I'm going to uh, again focus on one uh, illustrative example of that, and uh, it's an example of building a predictive digital twin, which you'll see will involve many different aspects of uh, computational science and, and engineering. So uh, let me transition now to talk about uh, some of my, again, the research in my, my own group. And what you're going to see is that we're building a predictive digital twin. We're going to be using reduced order modeling to give us scalable predictive modeling and combining that with uh, data-driven rapid uh, model updating using, using machine learning. So first off, what is a digital twin? A digital twin is a virtual model of a system, and it's not a virtual model of a system in the abstract, like we might use for design, but rather a virtual model of a system that's tied to a very specific uh, asset or, or product. So in the example you're going to see today, I'll be talking about an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV or a drone, and when we talk about a digital twin, there'll be a digital twin for each one of the UAVs in my, in my fleet of UAVs. And this digital twin, this virtual model, is not static. It's a living virtual model that will follow my aircraft through its life, through design, manufacturing, operation, and eventually disposal. And the virtual model, the digital twin, will be evolving as the vehicle is going through its life and, and changing, its, uh, changing its nature. So again, we're, we're interested in driving big decisions, high consequence decisions. So we need our digital twins to be predictive, we need them to be reliable, and we need them to be explainable. And again, this is something that cannot be done with the data alone. The data are incredibly powerful for this way of thinking, but we need to also bring in our predictive models, our physics-based models. I'm going to focus particularly on a digital twin that models the structural health of the unmanned aerial vehicle, of the UAV. So I want you in your minds to fast forward a few years, and uh, it's not too many years, to a world where we will have many, uh, many, many more UAVs flying around uh, doing all kinds of tasks for us, delivering pizzas, delivering packages, maybe even delivering people. And so imagine that world and just think of the many thousands of UAVs that will be flying in, in urban areas. So of course it's essential that these UAVs are going to be able to monitor their own structural health. And again, we're talking thousands of assets here, monitor their structural health. And it's essential that these vehicles, are, uh, if something were to happen while they were flying, are going to be able to make good decisions that uh, will result in safe behavior. So this is the notion of a self-aware aircraft, a self-aware aircraft, one that has uh, structural sensing capability, is able to monitor its own health, and then adapt its behavior based on potentially changing environmental conditions or changing structural health. And uh, we believe that a predictive digital twin is an essential role of doing this. Uh, so you can see there the flow. Again, these vehicles have uh, a lot of sensors on board, taking the structural data, using that data to estimate the current structural state, the health of the, of, of its, of the vehicle, of itself, using that uh, estimate of the structural health to update the flight capabilities. Given my health today, how fast can I fly? How tight of a corner can I turn? How aggressive can I be in my maneuvering? And then based on those updated capabilities, then be able to dynamically replan the mission. So again, this notion of a self-aware aircraft built on a predictive digital twin, the data are going to be an incredibly important part of what we do here, but we need the physics-based models. We need the physics-based models because we absolutely need to simulate previously unseen scenarios. It is not viable to think about sending a whole set of our UAVs and our fleet into failure simply to collect data about failure conditions. We need to use the physics-based models to play the what-if scenarios to generate simulation data for situations that we hope our vehicles will never get into. 
Uh, we need the physics-based models to encode the laws of physics. And again, the laws of physics are going, to what, are going to be what helps to make this problem tractable. They are going to define these low-dimensional manifolds in an otherwise uh, intractable vast space. The physics-based models have quantifiable uncertainty, and their parameters represent real-world quantities. In other words, they're interpretable. But there's a big catch. The physics-based models we saw on the earlier slide uh, manifest as systems of partial differential equations. When I apply something like the finite element uh, method to those partial differential equations, I'm going to get a big complex uh, computational model, which is fine if I'm sitting in the lab and uh, you know, running a handful of simulations. But in this kind of setting where we need to run many, many, many computations over many scenarios and also drive onboard decision making, these physics-based models are going to be too complex and too expensive uh, for our purposes. So this is where the notion of model reduction comes into play. And in particular, uh, in my group, we use projection-based model reduction. So what are we looking at here on the slide? On the left is the big system, shown here as a linear system of equations, that we ultimately end up solving when we take our physics-based model, uh, discretize it with a finite element method, apply our time-stepping, and get a big simulation code that can run these physics-based predictions. And typically, for the kinds of applications we look at, uh, again, these are big, complex models. We're talking about modeling a whole, a whole vehicle here. The solution time may be minutes or hours, and even in some cases, uh, we can have solutions that, that stretch to days or even weeks. So again, that's fine in some settings, but for our purposes, we need a model that's much, much faster to execute. And so the idea of projection-based model reduction is to find a, an approximate model, the model on the right, which is smaller, it's much faster to solve, yet it somehow encodes the most important dynamics of our physics-based model uh, in a way that we come up with a, an approximation model where uh, in, an, in an ideal setting we even may uh, be able to characterize just how good it is. And this, project, this, this model reduction is done mathematically. So there's really three main steps to projection-based model reduction. The first is a training step where we solve the PDEs, often called the truth model, to generate training data. So generate data over uh, many different scenarios. We then take the training data and analyze it to identify structure. And in particular, we're looking for low dimensional structure. Uh, many model reduction methods use a low dimensional basis. They use a low dimensional basis that defines a linear subspace. So a linear subspace of reduced dimension uh, that, that explains uh, most of the training data. And then finally, the third step is to create the reduced model. And that's done by now taking those, those large uh, physical equations, the PDE model, and projecting it mathematically onto the low dimensional subspace. So again, the three steps, and uh, for those of you who work in machine learning, you may look at these three steps and think this sounds somewhat like machine learning, and in particular, the training and the identification of structure steps are very much what happens in, in machine learning. You can see the third step there with the projection of the PDE is a little bit different. So that might uh, lead you to ask this question, which is, what is the connection between reduced order modeling and machine learning? And so if we were to go to uh, Wikipedia for the definitions, we can see them up there. Machine learning, the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions, relying on patterns and inference instead. Reduced order modeling, on the other hand, is a technique for reducing the computational complexity of mathematical models and numerical simulations. So by those definitions, they look to be very, very different uh, things. My own perspective is that they're actually very closely related, and perhaps <clears throat> the biggest difference is their heritage, the communities from which they've come. That model reduction comes from the CSNE, the computational science community, where we start with the physics, we get these big numerical simulation models, and then we look for structure to try to reduce these models. On the other hand, machine learning comes from computer science, where you start with a pile of data, uh, no physics-based model, and then try to infer structure and, and build the, the reduced model from the data. But in fact, if you start to dig into those steps, and in particular the training and the exploitation of structure, you'll see many, many points of similarity and even common methods uh, with different names, of course, in, in the two fields. Now, model reduction has the advantage that the physics are there. The physics are preserved in the low-dimensional model through the projection step. On the other hand, machine learning has the advantage that 
It's uh, much more flexible in the way that we can learn from data. And so, again, a natural question is, can we get the, the, both, the best of, of both worlds? And in, uh, what I'm going to show you next, we'll be, we'll be trying to get the, the best of, of both worlds. So I'm going to show you how we combine physics-based models and data together to build a digital twin. And the key ingredient are going to be these reduced order models. They are what give us physics-based models that are sufficiently low cost to be able to, uh, to, to serve our purposes in this setting. Now, this is not an easy problem to solve. Again, we're looking to build a reduced order model for an entire vehicle, for an entire uh, UAV. Uh, you saw the training step there. In the training step, we need to generate simulation data over many, many different scenarios. And that training is, is very expensive and gets very expensive uh, very quickly. A second challenge of existing methods is being able to scale to high dimensional parameters. You could imagine just how many parameters are needed to describe fully a digital twin of, again, an entire vehicle. And that becomes a huge challenge. And then uh, thirdly, we need to be able to deal with discontinuous parameter dependence, particularly the kind that's going to show up when the, the vehicle starts to get damaged, because remember, we're modeling the structural health of the vehicle. So these are all challenges for uh, reduced order modeling methods. The approach that we use that tackles all of these challenges is what's called the static condensation reduced basis element, the SCRIBE method. It came out of uh, Tony Patera's group at MIT a few years ago. And uh, I'm going to show you just graphically how the, the method works, but just philosophically, it uh, tackles these challenges through divide and conquer. What we're going to do is take this complex system, this unmanned aerial vehicle, we're going to break it into pieces. We're going to do the training and the building of the reduced order models on the pieces, and then we're going to uh, put the pieces back together to get the vehicle. And this is the way that, a way that we can, can make our reduced order modeling and our uh, training of the machine learning scalable. So again, divide and conquer. We're going to take the vehicle. We're going to break it into pieces. And in the example I'll show you, the pieces we're going to break it into are literally physical pieces of the vehicle. So one piece, one component, might be a section of the wing. And for the section, uh, for, this, for each component, so for this example, the section of the wing, the component will have an interior. And it will also have what we call a port, or the uh, boundaries, the interfaces of the component that need to be modeled so that when we come to put the pieces back together, we, uh, we can represent uh, how one component talks to another. We'll define geometric parameters associated with the component, and then also non-geometric parameters. So in the example of uh, here, the structural health uh, model that we're building, those, ge those non-geometric parameters might describe material properties, or they might describe the way that the composite structure is, is conducted. We're also going to introduce damage parameters, uh, and the damage parameters characterize the size and location of the damage, as well as its severity. And then we're going to have a physics-based model for each component. And in the example that I'll, I'll show you here, that physics-based model, again, is uh, a partial differential equation model. It's going to be linear elasticity combined with some, some model of, of damage. And at the high fidelity, uh, we'll be using finite elements. So in order to solve that physics-based model, we have to put down a uh, comp computational grid on the, on the wing. And you can see here just from the picture just how quickly, the, again, those models get very large due to the number of degrees of freedom we need to discretize the partial differential equations on the, on the wing. So that's all the action that has to go on at the component level. And we are going to train and build reduced order models at that component level. So we're going to have these local effects, this local parameterization. But of course, we all know that a complex nonlinear system is more than just the sum of its pieces. Linear superposition does not hold. We can't just break apart a, a system, uh, reduce the pieces, and then put it back together. We also need to account for the interactions. In other words, we have to think about those ports and all the parameters associated with them so that when we train the reduced model locally, we account for the interactions that will take place when it can get put together with a variety of other components. And uh, I won't be going into in any of the details, but there's a great deal of mathematical theory that sits underneath uh, this question of how does one train locally while accounting for global interactions. And then the third piece is we also have to model the context. 
Uh, so this is the environment, or in this particular setting, the loads parameters, the forces that will be on the component as the aircraft is flying and maneuvering. So we have to account for all of these when we, we build the models. Uh, so we're focused on building this digital twin. In my group, we also have the physical twin, uh, which is a custom-built flight test vehicle. You can see a picture of it there. It's a, uh, what's called a Telemaster fuselage, which, which is a sort of standard fuselage, and then the wings can pop in and out, so we can have many different wing sets in different states of damage that we'll be able to use for, for flight testing. Uh, we have a lot of sensing capability on board the vehicle. We have 24 strain gauges on each wing, but uh, primarily our data is driven by these Divinio uh, sensors, so that's a sticker about the size of a credit card, and we have a whole bunch of these things stuck onto the wings that provide temperature, pressure, humidity, uh, vibration, and dynamic strain data uh, collected as the vehicle is flying and as the, the, the structure is undergoing its, its loading. Uh, and I should say that this uh, flight test vehicle has been built together with Aurora Flight Sciences, uh, was built up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and arrived in Texas uh, just, just, last, just last month. So that's the physical flight vehicle. Here's a glimpse of some of the physics-based models of that, uh, of that vehicle that are gonna go into building the digital twin. Again, the underlying uh, model is a finite element model. You can uh, see there on the right of the slide, that's the actual interior, the internal structure of the wing. And you can see on the left, the pieces of that that are represented in the virtual model, in the finite element model, modeling the different material types, the carbon fiber, the carbon rod, <clears throat> the plywood, and the foam. And again, the key is the finite element model uh, is a good representation of how an aircraft structure behaves, but it's too expensive. With the reduced order models that we're building together uh, with, with Axelos, we get a thousand times speed up in the simulation times uh, but still get the accuracy that we need to drive uh, to to, uh, to drive the the decisions that, and d drive the simulations that we need for the for the digital twin. So again, uh, building the virtual models together with Axelos, that's a small uh, startup company that's really focused on reduced order models for for digital twins. Okay, so we need to put all the pieces together, and there are two. Uh, two main ingredients that will take us from component-based models up to the digital twin. The first is the notion of a library. So we build a library of uh, physics-based models at the component level. So for every component, every little piece of the vehicle, we're constructing reduced order models, and we're also constructing copies of that component in different damage states. And the damage states, you can see, uh, just in the example I'm gonna show you here, we have the pristine state where there's no damage, and then different levels, 20% damage, 40%, uh, 60%, and 80%, where the damage here relates to uh, the stiffness properties of the, of the structure. Again, all the training takes place at the component level, but accounting for the global and the, and the uh, context as well. So we build this library. The second uh, ingredient we need to get to the digital twin is the use of machine learning, and in particular, the training of a classifier. And a machine learning classifier is what is gonna let us uh, very quickly process onboard data from the vehicle and use it as a window to get into our uh, predictive physics-based models. So we're using, a, uh, as a classifier, we're using optimal classification trees. There's some very nice work from Dimitri Bertsimis group, at, again at MIT, uh, that has shown how to train uh, an optimal classification tree by posing the training problem as a mixed integer optimization problem that can be solved in a very scalable and very efficient way. Uh, as you probably know, with a, uh, a classification tree, you can either uh, require that the classification is axis aligned, as in the, the top plot there, where the classification is done purely on features, and for us, the features are gonna be the sensor data coming uh, from the strain measurements on our wing. Or we can also do the classification based on hyperplane splits, shown in the second, the lower plot, uh, where now classification is done, in this example, on linear combinations of sensors, of sensor data. But in either case, uh, one of the advantages of these optimal classification trees is that they're highly interpretable. Once you've trained the tree, you can go back and look and see exactly which is the sensor or sensors that are contributing towards you being classified into a particular damage state. 
And then, of course, that becomes a very natural framework to also drive questions uh, such as census selection. What are the sensors that you process in a very time-critical setting? Or even the design question of where are the places on your wing that you, you need to really be uh, putting, putting more sensing capability. And then the final uh, advantage of, of these approaches is that once the offline training is done, and again, the training is done by all these different simulations of our physics-based library based on the reduced models, then the online classification becomes very rapid. So I'm going to show you an example of how this comes together. Uh, this is an example we're going to see on the left side, the UAV flying a path through these obstacles. And you can see that there are two paths that can fly. One is a conservative path, which takes a longer time to fly. The other is a more aggressive flight path, which is faster to get to the, to the end point, but requires tighter turns around the obstacles. And tighter turns means higher loading, more, more uh, uh, strain or stress put on, onto, the, uh, onto the structure. We're going to see on the right uh, strain measurements being collected from three different sensors. And then below it, you'll see the, uh, the classification tree, which again is being trained offline, taking those strain measurements and using, it, using them to uh, classify what's going on on board the vehicle. So the vehicle starts flying. It's in a pristine state to start with. And then right about here on this first turn, it undergoes some kind of a damage event. And you see immediately as the, the strain, it's hard to see with the human eye what has changed about the strain signals. But the classification tree recognizes that change in the, in the sensor signal based on its training and is able to start classifying that now uh, we're in, into a different damage state. And you can see that as the vehicle continued to fly, the damage started off mild, started off at just 20% damage. As the vehicle continued to fly, you can see now the damage is getting worse and worse as the vehicle is flying. And at the point that the vehicle has to make that second turn, it's now in a bad enough damage state that it knows that it cannot make the aggressive turn. And so it makes the decision to switch to the more conservative flight path to uh, successfully complete the mission. So again, just an illustration, but showing you, again, the kind of power with these predictive physics-based models, providing the library that's playing all the what-if scenarios combined with the rapid classification from the interpretable machine learning. OK, so just in the last couple of minutes to, uh, to, to finish up, again, this notion of predictive data science, learning from data, incredibly powerful, but learning from data through the lens of models, through the lens of mathematical models, physics-based models, is really the only way to make otherwise uh, intractable problems tractable. It's a way to respect physical constraints, to embed domain knowledge, to bring interpretability to our results, to deal with the challenges of heterogeneous, noisy, and incomplete data, and to issue predictions with quantified uncertainties. And again, predictive data science, it really is bringing together the methods and the approaches and the philosophies of the field of data science with the field of computational science and engineering, uh, bringing these to bear on high consequence applications in science and engineering and medicine. So of course, this is a highly interdisciplinary notion. Uh, we already saw the definition of the field of computational science as being an interdisciplinary field. And now we're talking about also bringing in uh, notions from data science so really, there's a huge need for interdisciplinary research and interdisciplinary education that are at the interfaces of computer science, mathematics, uh, statistics, high-performance computing, and applications across science, engineering, and, and medicine. And that is, of course, what uh, we do at the Odin Institute at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, where I moved last year. Uh, really, this. Uh, interdisciplinary nature of, of research and education is at the heart of, of the construct of the Odin Institute, developing high-performance computing for some of the biggest problems in society. So with that, uh, I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for a fascinating and inspiring talk. We have time for roughly one quick question, if anyone has a quick one here at three. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I was curious if the combinational model uh, for kind of discrete components, putting those together, if that could also be applied to structures that don't necessarily have discrete components themselves to try and uh, make that a a smaller breakable part problem. 
so, so you're asking whether the, uh, the decomposition has to be in physical space or whether it could be in another, another space. Right. Absolutely. So uh, the notion of taking a very complex system and breaking it into parts and operating on the parts separately and putting it back together, again, this is a notion that sits in many scalable algorithms for computational science and engineering. And the one I showed you was really a domain decomposition approach where it's the physical system. But of course, one could think about decomposing a parameter space uh, decomposing uh, the physics, as in like an operator splitting approach where you have different physics and you could break it apart, or maybe decomposing the system uh, along ways that an engineer would not come up with, but that a machine learning algorithm might find decompositions. Uh, so I think that this, this notion of decomposition and then recomposition is an incredibly powerful approach and is actually going to be really critical for overcoming cursive dimensionality of high parameters and high complexity systems. Thank you. So we have a, a quick speaker gift from Michaela Taufer, the uh, SC19 general thank chair. You. And thank you. Please thank our speaker again.